Last time I was up here was uh, right at the end of uh, Governor Knowles' administration. There was a Western Governors Association meeting here, so um, I didn't know quite what to expect uh, coming up here. And I was sitting over there with a young man <clears throat> who said, well, how was the flight up? I'm from Oregon. And I said, really? Where were you? Where did you used to live? He says, well, near Roseburg, which is where, where uh, I practiced and first ran for office. And he says, furthermore, you spoke at my high school graduation. And one of his classmates I delivered. So uh, I feel at home already. It's just uh, <laughs> quite remarkable. Um, so I am, uh, want to set some expectations here. I am the backup for the backup speaker. So don't, don't expect too much, all right? Uh, it really is uh, a nice to be here. I'm, I'm very grateful for uh, State of Reform and, and, uh, and DJ to uh, include me in the program. Uh, I've been doing a little homework on the state and I know that you folks are facing some really unique issues here, a daunting, I mean really daunting budget deficit and, and runaway costs in your Medicaid program. So on fairly short notice, what I thought I would try to do to be uh, a value add here uh, is to share some of the experiences I've had with health policy reform really over the last three decades in Oregon uh, in the hopes that the, they will provide some perspectives uh, on how to deal with your own current problems, uh, recognizing that, they're, you know, that different states face different uh, sets, of, sets of issues. So I'd like to just start with some real basics. It seems to me that uh, if we're going to be successful in developing health policy, then we have to first agree on what we want that health policy to accomplish. So to me, the most fundamental question in the healthcare debate is whether our policy objective is to finance and deliver medical care or whether it's to keep people healthy. And if we can agree that the objective is health rather than financing medical care, then there are two additional issues that we have to come to terms with. And the first one is that healthcare is not necessarily synonymous with health although our entire system is predicated on that assumption. But if you think about it, the fact is that healthcare is a means to an end, not an end in itself. Healthcare doesn't have any intrinsic value outside its relationship to a positive health outcome except as an economic commodity, which unfortunately is pretty much how it's viewed, I'm sure, here in Oregon and across the nation. That's the first point. <clears throat> the second point, um, <clears throat> if you look at those things that have the biggest impact on your lifetime health status, healthcare is actually not very important. In fact, if you back out genetics, healthcare is less than, you know, between 10 and 20% in terms of its contribution to your lifetime health status. Socioeconomic factors are much bigger. Uh, lifestyle and behavioral issues, which of course are impacted by lifestyle and behavioral issues, environmental factors, those have a much larger impact on lifetime health status to, that, than does our healthcare system. So if our policy goal is health, but we continue to spend more and more of the budget on medical care at the expense of investments in these social determinants of health, we're not going to meet our long-term policy objective. And in fact, it's been our historic pattern as a nation to prioritize medical care over social investments that have led us to this curious point where we now spend almost 18% of our GDP, over $3 trillion a year, on this huge industry that manages to make a healthy profit producing goods and services that most of its customers can't afford and get fairly poor health, uh, population health uh, outcomes for that expenditure. So that not only is contrary to our policy objective, it also doesn't make a lot of sense. Now, <clears throat> the problem is that the rising cost of health care precludes us from spending money in, 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 in other areas because increasingly we're relying on public resources to finance the cost of health care, and that, that trend is actually accelerating. So in Oregon, we have a population of about 4 million people. We have 1.1 million Oregonians on Medicaid. We have another uh, 750,000 people on Medicare, and as you know, with the aging of my generation, another 10,000 people every day are coming onto the Medicare program. So currently we have 1,850,000 1, people on publicly financed health care, and that's going to continue to go up. Now to me, it's very important to make a distinction between public dollars and private dollars. Public dollars are part of a fiscal commons. They are resources that were raised from all of us, and in my view should be spent in a way that benefits all of us, not just some of us. More importantly, public resources are finite, as you are discovering here in Alaska. They're not unlimited. If they were unlimited, policymakers wouldn't have to make any difficult budget choices, and we wouldn't have a $20 trillion national debt. 
So public resources are part of a fiscal commons, and that commons is finite, which means that a decision to spend resources on one set of services is always, and at the same time, a decision not to spend those resources on another set of services. So we find ourselves in a vicious cycle where we're spending more and more of our limited public resources on an enterprise that produces less and less health while spending less and less on those social investments that we know would have a much greater long-term impact on the health of our population. So how do we re reverse that cycle? Well, there's two things, there's probably a lot of things, but there's at least two things that I think we could, we could try to do as policy objectives. One would be to reduce the rate the medical inflation rate to something that's at or below uh, the growth rate in the general population. So it doesn't continue to you know, be the Pac-Man, I guess that dates me, doesn't it? It doesn't continue to eat up the public budget. That's the first thing. The second thing is to try to figure out how to gradually redeploy resources from medical budgets into the community to begin to address the social determinants of health. So with that introduction and that context, let me describe to you uh, so what we've been up to uh, in Oregon with the development of what we call coordinated care organizations. Coordinated care organizations uh, grew out of the recession, out of the scarcity of the recession in 2011. And the reason I mention this is because I believe that, that fiscal crises, uh, while terrifying from a political standpoint, do provide opportunities for true innovation. And this, I think, is a great example of that. So when I was reelected in 2011, we had a, <clears throat> a huge, uh, shortfall in our budget at that time about three uh, about three billion three and a half billion dollars and um, uh, you, know, you know one of the reasons it's so hard to reform the medical system is that uh, that we keep paying for it right as long as we can continue to finance the status quo no one's going to you know turn around and, and, and do something fundamentally different well in 2011 an incentive arrived un, 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 unwelcomed which was a 1.2 billion dollar hole in the Medicaid budget and that hole was due to um, the recession with higher caseload on Medicaid and to this big general fund a hole. And if we had continued to cover everyone who was currently eligible with no replacement revenue, this would have amounted to a 39% cut in provider reimbursement rate. So through the, a combination of benefit changes, uh, administrative efficiencies, and, and reducing the benefit a little bit, and front-end loading the resources that we did have into the first year of Oregon's two-year budget cycle, we were able to take that 39% cut down to about 11%. But that still left us with a $250 million hole in the second year of the biennium. $600 million hole if you count the federal match rate. And we propose to fill that hole with cost savings from reforming or transforming the care model, the Medicaid care model, to get more value in terms of health outcomes for each dollar spent. Now, when I put my budget together and submitted it to the legislature in 2011, I had no idea how we were actually going to transform the system, but that's where we started. Now, have you ever heard the term betting on the come? So Winston, uh, the uh, Webster's Dictionary defines this as you don't have what you need now at the moment, but you are betting or hoping that you will have what you need when the time comes. So we were betting on the come when we put that budget together, assuming we were going to make up $250 million in the second year of the biennium. Now, as it turns out, it's actually not that hard to reduce the cost of health care while maintaining quality and outcomes. It's just that there's no incentive to do it. There's no motivation to do it as long as we keep feeding the beast. All right? So it was the fiscal crisis in 2011 that created the motivation to change. Providers were motivated by trying to avoid a 39% rate cut, and the legislature was motivated by the notion that somehow, magically, $250 million of cuts would be avoided, even though we couldn't explain exactly how we were gonna do it. So in March of 2012, legislation was adopted that, that laid out the criteria for establishing a coordinated care organization. Coordinated care organizations are local community-based entities with all kinds of providers that work together in their local community uh, to uh, uh, better integrate care, uh, to better coordinate care. They're patient-centered, they're team-focused, and they seek to reduce health disparities. And they're also accountable for the health and the cost of the people in, in, in the organization. So the first of Oregon's 16 coordinated care organizations went online uh, in uh, the last part of 2012. Now remember, our budget cycle goes from 2011 to 2013. So we had them up and running, but it was very clear that even if we were able to 
uh, secure significant cost savings from this new care model, the system change couldn't happen fast enough to get that money into the budget. So we still had that hole in, in that biennial budget. So in May, I went back to Washington, D.C. and was able to convince the Obama administration not only to give us the Section 1115 waivers needed for the CARE model, but also to give us a $1.9 billion five-year investment in the coordinated care organizations. In exchange for, so there's another side of the handshake, in exchange for a commitment to reduce the Medicaid trend rate from 5.4% to 3.4%, two percentage points drop by the second year of the five-year waiver, without reducing benefits, without reducing um, uh, eligibility, and meeting rigorous outcome and quality metrics. So that was the deal. So the wa waiver also did something else that's very important. It granted flexibility in the CCO budgets to allow them to spend Medicaid dollars on things that weren't traditionally considered medical services, but had a significant uh, impact on, on health and reduced costs. So for example, if you have a, an elderly woman with well-managed congestive heart failure in an unair conditioned apartment and a, and, and a heat wave occurs, the temperature can go up enough to put enough strain on her system to kick her on over into a full-blown CHF. So you could buy a window air conditioner, window air conditioner with Medicaid dollars and that would count under, under our waiver. Now it's important to understand why this $1.9 billion investment was necessary and what the expectations were, were around it. So anytime you have a major system transformation, whether it's healthcare or energy or education, um, you have to, there's a transition period when you're moving from the current system to the new system. So it's like changing the tire on a car, right? And Dr. Don Berwick calls this moving from the current state to the future state. So if this is the old Medicaid program we're trying to fix, and this is the new CCO model, and this is economic burden on the various stakeholders who are a party, hospitals, doctors, everybody else, and this is time, if you could move from the current state to the future state and the economic burden would go down on everybody in the process, the politics would be pretty easy, right? Everyone would win. The problem is that because you have to run the old system and the new system for a while at the same time, there's a period where the cost actually goes up for most of the stakeholders, sort of shown as a hump on this, on this slide here. Unless you can figure out how to fund the hump in that transformation period, in that transition period, the stakeholders will dig in and, and individually or collectively stop anything that might jeopardize their short-term economic interests, right? So when we created the CCO model, we knew we had to make an investment to allow a gradual shift from the old system to the new system. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> we knew we had to pay for it, but we were in the middle of the Great Recession and we didn't have any pocket chains lying around. So we were gonna fund the hump by transforming the, medical, the, the healthcare system uh, for Medicaid, right? When it became apparent that the system change wasn't gonna happen fast enough, we went and got the federal government to basically fund the hump for us on a five-year schedule where those payments gradually went down as the cost savings from the coordinated care organizations began to come back up, right? So it wasn't just giving us money to prop up the old Medicaid program, it was creating a five-year glide path to give us time to transform this, the old system and, and while we were still operating the new one. And that's exactly what we did. All 16 coordinated care organizations are operating at or below the 3.4% per member per month growth rate. And all of them are meeting most, if not all, of the rigorous quality and outcome metrics that were required under the waiver. That brings us up to today. Now that glide path and that $1.9 billion expires next year uh, at the end of this first five year waiver period. So the question is where do we go from here? What's the next step forward? And again, um, Oregon finds itself with a $1 billion hole in its Medicaid budget, not unlike we had in 2011. But now it's not due to the recession, it's due to the reduction in the match rate under the Affordable Care Act, which you know is going from 100% down to 90%, and a general reduction in our overall Medicaid match rate because the economy the economy's improving. So it seems to me that this fiscal challenge it's not quite as big as it was uh, in 2011, but it offers us exactly the same opportunity to take yet another transformational step. One that I think will be far more important in the long run than the creation of the CCOs in 2011, but in the short term it's gonna be a lot more difficult because it involves a cultural change uh, in our healthcare system and a reallocation of public resources in a very different way from the way they're currently being spent. So you know, during the years that I was being trained as a physician, uh, I was taught that the most direct pathway to health 
inevitably runs through the medical system. So when I thought about uh, health, I thought about hospitals and doctors and, and insulin and uh, artificial heart valves. Uh, I didn't think about things like uh, housing or schools or a good job you know, or, uh, or a stable attached family. But it's clear, as we've just discussed, those things make a far greater impact on community health than to spending money on medical care. So to illustrate that, let's take a moment and compare the United States with some of the OECD nations um, on a couple of key metrics. And OECD, as you know, is the Organization for Economic Development Cooperation. And it's most of Europe, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, Korea, uh, the United States, uh, Alaska, or Alaska is, is part of the United States last time I checked. Uh, Canada and, 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 uh, and Mexico. So if you look at the uh, amount of money we spend on health care per as a percent of a GDP, we are a total outlier. About 18% of our, uh, of our bud, uh, economy goes to health care, and it's about 10% for the uh, rest of the OECD nations. Then if you look at the amount of health spending, which would include medical care and social investment, you will see that the United States spends far more on medical care than it does on social investment, which is almost exactly opposite of the OECD nations. And then if you look at the ratio of medical spending to health spending, you can see that once again, we are a total outlier on the far left-hand side of the chart. And the OECD nations have far better uh, health outcomes than the United States, which is testimony to the fact that sustained effective investment in social determinants of health will keep your community and your nation far healthier than simply continuing to spend money on medical care. Furthermore, as we discussed, in a zero-sum budget, that is a budget where resources are limited, the decision, decision to spend more money on medical care is a decision not to spend more money on the social determinants of health. So there's a lot of public money in the system right now. Uh, and I'll just use Oregon numbers. Uh, the coordinated care organizations last year had 900 million dollars in uh, cash and investments. And last year, Oregon hospitals saw their net income increase by $360 million because of the significant reduction in charity care because of the expansion of Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act. Again, public dollars are part of the, part of the fiscal commons. So the central challenge to me over this next five-year waiver period, the next transformational step is to figure out how we can start redeploying dollars out of the medical budget into the community to address those social investments that make a far bigger difference in the long term, and addressing the adverse childhood experiences that we know are directly related to behavioral and addiction issues and a whole host of shortened lifespans and poor lifestyle choices and chronic medical conditions. So how do we go about doing that? I'm not suggesting that CCOs and hospitals become housing authorities or school districts or social service agencies, but what I am saying is we've reached a point in this nation at a $3 trillion a year expenditure on medical care and a national debt of $20 trillion, where we're at a pivotal point in deciding how we're going to make the additional investments in the health uh, of our nation. Knowing as we do that most of what we see in our hospitals and in our clinics is the aftermath, the symptoms of problems that occur first in our homes and in our neighborhoods and in our communities. Knowing that as we do, and continuing to feed this stark imbalance between medical spending and social spending, I think is increasingly hard to defend and becomes immoral at some point. So let's look at the two ways that we can begin to change that. The first has to do with hospital community benefit. As you know, in, in, and these are Oregon numbers, I don't know what the situation is up here, but in exchange for their not-for-profit status, Hospitals are required to provide a community benefit, right? Last year in Oregon, our, our hospital spent almost $1.9 billion on community benefit. But look at how it was spent. 66% was spent on offsetting the differential between what Medicare and Medicaid paid and what the hospitals felt their cost was. Although, and this is not a pejorative statement, hospital costs are determined by the hospital through a extraordinarily opaque process, right? Then you have a little bit spent on <clears throat> research, medical education, charity care. Of that $1.9 billion, only 1% is spent on community health improvement. The rest of it's spent inside the medical budget. What's wrong with that picture, right? So it seems to me that at least in Oregon, we're about to have a lively debate 
about what to do with hospital community benefit. And I think it doesn't have to be a contentious debate as long as we begin to ask ourselves, what is our policy objective? There isn't a hospital in Oregon that doesn't have community health as part of their mission statement. So how do we create a path where over the course of the next few years, more and more of the hospital community benefit is actually moved out of the medical budget and into the community? The second step would be to try to use the uh, uh, $1 billion budget hole that we have in Medicaid, just as we did in 2011, and use it to leverage another federal investment over the next five years, but one that actually creates a glide path in which we could actually begin to move dollars out of the CCO medical budgets and into the, uh, into the uh, community. So <clears throat> one way to accomplish this is to redefine, as a part of the waiver, medical loss ratio. Now, as you know, the medical loss ratio is defined as the percent of the premium dollar that's spent on health care or medical claims, right? Right now in Oregon, it's, for the CCOs, I think it's 85-15. And so we're our policy now is that, and consumers are very supportive of this as well, let's drive that higher so that more and more money is spent on medical claims and less and less on administrative overhead, right? The problem with that is that anchors us to the old system. It simply drives more and more dollars into the medical budget as opposed to uh, moving them out into the community. So suppose as a part of the waiver, we uh, replace medical loss ratio with the health loss ratio. So the health loss ratio would count investments in medical care and investments in, in, in social spending. So if the medical loss ratio is 85-15, 85 on medical care and 15 on administration, the health loss ratio would be 85-0, 85% of medical care, but none on social investment. And suppose then that over the course of the next five-year waiver, you, in return for filling the budget hole, for giving us another $1.2, $1.3 billion, each year the CCOs had to move another 5% out of their medical budget and begin to invest it in the social determinants of health or in, in preventing adverse childhood experiences. So at the end of the five-year period, for both hospitals and coordinated care organizations, Investing money in the community to directly address the social determinants of health has become an integral part of their business model rather than simply an afterthought. Finally, we need to make sure that these investments in the community, whether they're from the uh, uh, hospital community benefit or from the health loss ratio, have got to be targeted in those areas that have good research-driven outcomes that we know will work, and they need to be coordinated with other investments made by other entities in the community so that they create a powerful collective social impact. So I'm going to stop here. Uh, I know that I've thrown an awful lot of information at you late in the day uh, and in a very short period of time, and maybe we can explore some of these issues in more detail, uh, and I think we're going to have a little time for questions and answers. But I want to leave you with just one thought. If there's one takeaway here, the takeaway is that with the right leadership, a fiscal crisis provides an incredible opportunity for innovation and doing things that would not be possible with money running in uh, over the transom. Uh, President Lyndon Johnson, the secretary for HEW, Health Education Welfare, was a guy named John Gardner, and uh, he once said, and I think this is just a wonderful quote, um, all of us are faced with a series of great opportunities brilliantly disguised as insoluble problems. It seems to me you have a brilliant opportunity here in Alaska. Thanks. Well, I think, you know, one thing that dominates all conversation about Alaska healthcare and policy generally is the, is the, uh, the fiscal state of things. Uh, and it, I think, has generated as I observe Alaska health policy, it has generated some anxiety about change, and there's a little bit of emotion wrapped up in that. And, um, talk us through what transforming, particularly the Medicaid system, but this was really a, about transforming the entire healthcare system. Walk us through what that was like, both in the CCOs, but also when you launched the first time, the first time managed care was really involved in, in Oregon's Medicaid and the Oregon Health Plan when you were president of the Senate. Uh, walk us through what that was like in terms of working with stakeholders, getting people to understand a common vision. How, 
how did that happen? Well, when we, when we enacted the Oregon Health Plan, which was actually implemented eventually in 1994, the Oregon Health Plan really was a, uh, it didn't, didn't really transform the delivery model, right? It was a, it was a it, issue of equity. We did essentially what the ACA did. We said everyone below 100% of the federal poverty level should be eligible for Medicaid, regardless of what category you were in. And then we shift the debate then from who is covered to what is covered, and we created this priority list uh, to build the benefit based on the relative effectiveness of each service to, in, you know, for the whole, entire population. We also increased the payment rates to make them closer to commercial. So at that point, a lot of these independent practice organizations, these physician-invested organizations bl blossomed to take advantage of that better reimbursement rate and begin to take care of the Medicaid population. So about half the coordinated care organizations grew out of those IPAs. So they had some, some history with that. But I think the, the, the important point with, with the big transformational effort that we've been under for the last uh, five years now is that there's no doubt about it. The crisis, the funding crisis created the opportunity. Um, and I, I'm sure this is true in Alaska and just about every other state, except the United States Congress, because it can push its difficult fiscal choices into the national debt for our children to pay for. But states basically have to deal with real-time dollars. And as long as you keep paying for the status quo, it's not going to change. So what we had traditionally done in Oregon is that in times of fiscal shortfall, we'd cut from the current program structure in the hopes that when the economy got better, we could pay it back. So we, we would do less of the same at the hopes that in the future we could do more of the same. Well, with a budget crisis, doing more of the same wasn't an option. So we could do a lot less, or we could change what we were doing. So I think that the, the realization that we weren't totally victims with the budget crisis was very significant. And it was the 39% provider cut that got people to wake up and say, well, we can take the cut, or we can really figure out something different. A lot of trepidation. Uh, the early days of the coordinated care organizations when we um, had the waiver uh, and we were implementing it, uh, a lot of hand-wringing, a lot of consternation. People didn't know how we were going to live within a 3.4% growth cap. As they began to figure it out, because they'd never even had to try before, this energy began to develop. People began to say, oh my god, we can do this. This is pretty exciting. And, and it became almost inspirational, these meetings that we'd have every, every month. And I think that that opportunity exists in whether it's healthcare or education, uh, just about anything. You've got to create a space where you have to change, uh, and then you have to have leadership and creativity to take advantage of that opportunity. I want to make sure you all can ask a question, if you'd like, also because I'm losing my voice. Uh, so Rita and Stephanie have some hand mics. So if you, you have a question, go ahead and raise your hand. Here's a little uh, sniff there. I got that from Trump. <laughs> Governor, I, you know, I, this notion of, uh, of buy-in, I think, is, is, uh, is a tricky one. And I, I get the sense in listening to folks here today, and as I, as I listen to folks in Alaska's healthcare community often, um, figuring out the, the, the right roles for everybody is, is tough. It's tough. Uh, and, we, and, and, and Alaska has a governor with a policy vision, but the implementation, the devil is always in the details. What role did you see in Oregon and in your observations of other states for hospitals specifically, maybe for your provider groups specifically? Were they laggards? Were they leaders? Were they validators or were they naysayers? How did those folks yeah, play out? I, I would say that, you know, Oregon is, um, I think much like Alaska in the sense that it's not very big. I mean, you know, you're really big, but in terms of the population, you know, in Oregon, I can tell you the 20 people you need to get around the table to and agree to really move the, move the dial on healthcare. It's, it's not, we, we know each other, right? So I think one of the challenges, and I think, uh, I guess if I uh, provided some unsolicited advice to the, to the governor, I think the governor's role is the convener. That's the one thing, that's the most powerful thing you, you, you do as a governor. If you invite the head of the Sierra Club and the head of the Oregon Forest Industry Council to come to your conference room and meet, they will show up. They will hate it every, every minute on the drive over, but they will show up. And we had innumerable meetings out at the governor's residence where we had all the players around the table. Uh, you know, had a little wine, uh, had a conversation. And it's amazing what happens when people actually break bread together and, and, and have an unfettered conversation. And 
when we got it uh, in 2011, the Oregon House of Representatives, which has 60 members, was split 30-30. That didn't hurt. People thought that was going to be a disaster, but in fact, it gave us the ability to build really big bipartisan majorities because this wasn't a partisan issue. Now, you may think Oregon's a blue state and Alaska's a red state. Uh, I practiced medicine and was elected from the reddest of red counties in southern Oregon, uh, timber capital of the world, uh, sometimes by as much as 60%. And that had less to do with my politics than it did with the fact that I knew these people. I took care of them in the ER. We'd go drink beer together. We could disagree without being disagreeable. And I think that is possible in a small city. You can't do that in New York, you can't do that in New Jersey, and you can't do it in California. So uh, it's creating a big table, it's respecting everyone, it's not starting out saying hospitals are bad, or drug companies are bad, or the unions are bad. It's saying we have a common problem here. You know? And people who are Republicans or Democrats, people who are conservative or libertarian or liberal, they all get heart attacks. They all have kids who have croup. Right? And if we can get beyond the labels, and you do that by convening and by uh, being respectful, you can move mountains. Questions? Yeah. Thank you. Um, I was curious, you almost uh, went down the road of uh, discussing uh, school districts and housing authorities as CCOs. Could you elaborate on that a little bit? Has that taken any root in Oregon, or is that? Uh, yeah. of any consideration. So, so the, the point I was trying to make is that I would say that uh, building low affordable housing is not a core competency of most hospitals. It's certainly not something doctors know anything about. Um, so I wasn't suggesting that, um, that the hospital or the CCO become the housing authority, right, or become the social service agency, but they can provide the leadership to begin to recognize and articulate the fact that if our community mission, if community health is part of our mission, then they can begin to make a larger investment in community health. And that has, in fact, started in Oregon. Th three hospitals, five hospitals, and I think one of the CCOs, or part of a CCO, something called Care Oregon, uh, put uh, $21 million uh, into three uh, low-income housing projects that's being run through something called uh, Central C City Concern, which does build low-income housing. So uh, I, I think that this doesn't have to become part of the core competency of a hospital, but they can partner with those entities that are already in the community and they know how to do it. I had a question up here. Hi. Um, first of all, thanks for, just thanks for being here. It's just an honor that you were able to come up and, and enjoy the conference. So thanks to DJ for making that happen as well. So can you speak a little bit to the role of provider engagement as the <coughs> CCO process developed? And was this um, conceptualized and developed within state government? How did providers engage? How important was it that you had providers at the table as you were developing this model? Yeah, it, that, uh, provider engagement is absolutely critical. So we had, uh, when we put this together, as I said, we had a, an idea. We didn't know quite how we were gonna do it. We knew sort of the general elements of a coordinated care organization. We wanted it to be local, so that, so that the community owned it. Uh, we wanted, um, uh, we wanted to, to better integrate and coordinate care. So there's certain aspects that we thought were important, and those were really basically written into the legislation. And then we invited those entities who wanted to become a coordinated care organization to bring a business plan in that met those outlines. And so the, the coordinated, the CCOs are all different. There's one in Eastern Oregon uh, that uh, uh, we have a representative from that that has, was it 12, 15 counties? 12 counties. I mean, it's like it's the eastern half of the state. They've got a set of issues about uh, you know lack of specialty care, a whole host of issues there. You've got this huge two of them in the Portland metropolitan area, one on the south coast. They're all different, but they all have to meet the same outcome metrics. So they, essentially, it was the provider engagement that created the, the entity that became the coordinated care organization. And in the run-up to that, we had a, a joint legislative committee, a, a bipartisan committee, really big committee, had lots and lots of legislators on it, so everyone had some ownership. And they let every stakeholder in the world come and talk to them. And then I had a set of meetings out at the governor's residence with you know, representatives of the major stakeholder groups, whether it was the unions, whether it was the hospitals, the doctors, uh, to make sure that we were communicating with one another. And if something came up in the legislative process that bothered one of them, we'd bring it back to the table and wouldn't just sort of you know, go in and lobby against it. Uh, but that local ownership is, is absolutely uh, absolutely critical, that kind of engagement. Other questions? Yeah. Hi, Governor. Um, I wonder if you could reflect back on what you thought would happen and tell us where something changed that caught you by surprise, and secondly, what you would do differently if you were doing it again. 
So um, I'm one of those people that believe that there's no survival value in pessimism. Uh, so you know, um, I believed it would work, and I couldn't. I, I didn't know how it was going to work, but I really do, did believe that. Uh, you know, I know a lot of doctors in Oregon. I know the leaders of the hospitals, the insurance companies, and you know, on a, we know each other, right? And, and I knew that this was a creative group of people uh, that could make, that were perfectly capable of figuring this out. <clears throat> what they didn't want is me or the government to tell them how to do it. What we gave them was a set of sideboards and a set of outcomes. And so um, what surprised me was the speed with which they embraced it and became enthusiastic about it. Uh, because, you know, this was, a, this was a, a, they were going into the unknown, truly, right? Uh, so that was a big surprise uh, to me uh, and very gratif gratifying. Uh, I think the one thing I would have done different um, is that right now um, the board that runs the CCO it's got to have a majority of the board has to be people who are at risk, right? I would have made a majority of that, if I could do it over again, uh, members of the community. So, so, right, and the reason, an example of why that we should have done that is the CCO in Lane County, which uh, grew out of a, a, an IPA, uh, was purchased by Centene, uh, which as you know is a Medicaid managed care company out of Missouri. Um, those IPAs that I described that were formed in the 90s to create the Oregon Health Plan have investor, physician investors. They were 40 and 50 then. They're 60 and 70 now and they want to get cashed out and they ought to be able to be cashed out, but not that way. Uh, several CCOs, one of the health systems tried to actually purchase that CCO, but no one could bring the kind of money to the table that Centene could bring. It's not a criticism of Centene, that's his business model, but, but the decisions that, they, that Centene makes is about return on investment for shareholders, and those decisions are being made now in, in, in St. Louis, not in, 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 in Lane County. And there are others that are looking uh, hungrily at that kind of money. So we've got to get ahead of that one. We have to give these docs a way to get cashed out, but in a way that keeps the, the coordinated care organization a community asset. Otherwise, uh, the, this experiment will not work. Other questions of Governor Kitzhaber? You know, those, uh, you've always been really committed to that local control and local ownership piece of these CCOs. You know, the notion that uh, elected officials from a county or a municipality or a borough uh, would have a governing role and a governing vote on uh, sort of an insurance system, you know, which is not what it is, right? It's a right. De transformational uh, delivery system, but, but that you would empower through legislation to put your elected officials and your nonprofit leaders on the governing boards of these agencies, uh, I think is interestingly uh, exactly in line with the kind of thing that could develop here. I think you've got stuff in Fairbanks playing out that is tremendously innovative. Uh, so all that to say, I think the fiscal crisis is applic applicable. I think the community nature is applicable. I think the stakeholder interest is applicable. And uh, I think your comments are, are welcome and appreciated. Let, so. let me just give you one last shot, because I think this local control <laughs> thing, if you will, or local engagement is really important. And I'm going to give you an analogy. Uh, back in the uh, mid-1990s, the coastal coho salmon in Oregon was going to be listed under the ESA. And we created something called the Oregon Plan for Salmon Watersheds that directly engaged the local communities, the environmental community, the wood products industry, the agricultural community in a non-regulatory voluntary effort to improve the health of, of watersheds. And the, the delivery mechanism is something called the Local Watershed Council, which is a non-governmental, voluntary, non-regulatory group of citizens who are doing something together on behalf of a shared place. Place is really important. And when I looked at them working together, there'd be members of the, of the local, you know, Sierra Club, there'd be farmers, there'd be people who made their uh, living setting chokers in the woods, right? Who didn't apparently have a lot together, uh, in common together. But as they began to work together, something magic happened. Not only were they improving the watershed, but they were building community. All of a sudden they realized that they had that common ground. And I just think that is so important. And if you can take this fiscal crisis and figure out a way it's not completely top down. I mean, you have to have some parameters and some outcomes, but then empower uh, people at the, at the community level. Uh, I think it is just uh, really, really amazing. And I th we've demonstrated in Oregon uh, on a whole host of issues, education, the environment, healthcare, that that's possible. And you can do it here. Governor, thank you very much. Let's give him a round of applause.